And you, you can have your main event of the evening. Hello and welcome to These Days Are Hours, a Happy Days podcast. I'm Peter. And I'm Joe. And today, we will be discussing Season 7, Episode 3, Marion Goes to Jail. Okay, Peter, what happens in Marion Goes to Jail? Well, besides the obvious. We open at the Cunningham house, where Howard is practicing his golf putt. Richie and Joni make fun of him. And he misses by a mile and a half! What an awful putt! And Howard claims he's not used to his new glasses. Then Marion runs in, claiming that the DeSoto has been stolen while she was at the dress shop by Arnold's, the one up the hill. She would have gone to Arnold's to call the police, but there was a big commotion there, so she came right home instead. She calls the police, and then at that moment, the police knock on their door. Oh, thank you, operator. That's speedy service. It's Officer Kirk, there to tell them that the DeSoto has been found, and he'll bring them to it. Cut to Arnold's, where the DeSoto is lodged into one of the walls. The Cunninghams arrive, and Howard is naturally horrified to see his beloved car like this. My poor DeSoto! My poor man! Marion asks Al if he saw the thieves, but all Al saw was his wall get demolished. Bonzi then arrives, having gotten a call for his tow truck. I got a call on my tow truck for a 49 DeSoto. I flew here. I'm talking flew here. Officer Kirk enters. He and Fonzie snipe at each other, and then Fonzie goes to hook up his truck to the car. Kirk says that the car wasn't stolen. It just rolled down the hill because the emergency brake hadn't been set. Howard accuses Marion of forgetting to set the emergency brake, while Joni and Richie try to get him to calm down. Everybody forgets, Dad. Yes, but the time to forget is not when you're parked at the top of a hill. Yeah, but Dad, we don't know for sure it's Mom's fault. Kirk has Marion sign a ticket for vehicular negligence, failure to obey safety regulations, exceeding the speed limit, destruction of public property, and going over a red light. I'll see you in court. Richie and Joni excuse themselves to, uh, go help Fonzie, as Howard has a discussion with Marion. He says this is the most irresponsible, incompetent thing she's ever done, and when she quietly says everyone makes mistakes, he says the state of Wisconsin made a mistake giving her a driver's license. The next day, Howard comes downstairs, ready for the Leopard Lodge golf tournament, only to find Marion isn't there, and breakfast isn't ready. Howard, I am not speaking to you. Give this note to Richie. She's gone to court to take full responsibility for what happened. Howard calls her dramatic, and Richie and Joni demand to know what he said to her. Howard admits he lost his temper, but she shouldn't have been so careless. Still, he wants to make it up to her, so after the game, he'll bring home Chinese food for dinner. Chachi, who is caddying for Howard, shows up. Do you sure you want to play golf in this weather? Yes, I do. It looks like it could snow any minute. Bag's right over there, Chachi. Howard considers not going to the game for Marion's sake, but is convinced by Richie and Joni that they can handle this. At Arnold's, where everyone is wearing coats because of the cold weather and the giant hole in the wall, Richie and Joni call the courthouse, but have no luck finding Marion. No, no, I, I don't want the lost and found. Richie wants to drive down to find her, but Joni says their mother can take care of herself. Ralph and Patsy try to talk Al into letting them repair the wall for $200, then knock the price down to $30. We guarantee the work! Yeah. In writing? All right, $30. Fonzie snaps his fingers to make the phone ring, then answers it. However, the voice on the other end is not Paula Petrolunga, like he was hoping, but Marion Cunningham, who wants Fonzie to give Richie and Joni a message. She's in jail. Hello, Dad. I'm in jail. Richie, Joni, and Fonzie visit the uniform-clad Marion in jail. They set off the alarm by hugging her, though Fonzie is able to turn it off easily, and Gloria, the prison guard, hits on him. How'd you do that? Hey, it's all in the roof. <laughs> And a cute little wrist it is. Marion explains she was given a choice between a $50 fine or five days in jail. And this is her way of proving to Howard that she's neither incompetent nor irresponsible. Both Richie and Joni just want to pay the fine. But Fonzie wants to let Marion make her decision. Mr. C, this is your play. We'll do it your way. Though to be safe, he's going to go talk to the female warden. Ralph and Patsy also stop by to visit, and then Richie confirms that Howard went to the golf tournament, so he doesn't know about Marion's predicament. Marion is fine with them telling him, though. You could tell him. Gloria says visiting time is over, and Marion is escorted away. As she leaves, she says they can tell Howard she hopes he's comfortable snuggling up to his DeSoto. Back at the Cunningham house, Richie wants to tell Howard Marion won an all-expenses-paid trip to France. No, that's ridiculous. True. England? Rich. All right. But Joni convinces him to be mature and tell the truth. Howard and Shachi arrive with good news. Howard won the tournament. That's good. Because no one else showed up because of the weather. That's bad. Shachi leaves. That's good. And upon being asked by Howard, Richie and Joni admit that Marion is spending the next five days in jail. That's bad. Can I go now? Howard leaves to go see her. 
At jail, Fonzie is visiting Marion, though she's trying to maintain her composure. She quickly breaks down and admits this was stupid and she wants to go home. Fonzie is about to leave when Gloria reports that Howard is coming, so he doesn't see Marion crying. The three of them begin laughing together. <laughs> Howard enters and says he would like to talk to Marion alone. Fonzie goes to wait with Richie and Joni, and Howard admits to Marion that he lost his temper and he was wrong. He doesn't care about the DeSoto, or the fine, or the accident. He just cares about Marion. He loves her, and he paid the fine, so they can go home. Marion says she loves him too, and they embrace and kiss, setting off the alarm. What the heck is <laughs> Back at the Cunningham house, where Howard and Marion are having a romantic dinner of Chinese food, Fonzie gives Howard his bill for the DeSoto. Lay bill. Huh, I knew I couldn't avoid that DeSoto bill for very long. Since you don't charge family, he ended up only charging Howard $7.50 for fixing the emergency brake, the one Fonzie said to fix three months ago. It was broken long before Marion had it. Marion is, naturally, pissed at Howard. Howard, I could oh, just, I, I could just... Let me see what my fortune cookie says. He cracks open his fortune cookie and reads, Loving wife always forgives loving husband. They kiss. Thank you, Peter. That was Marion Goes to Jail. It first aired back on October 2nd, 1979. Happy Days was followed by a new Angie, in which Angie's sister Marie develops a crush on Angie's husband, Brad. Marie is so embarrassed, she considers becoming a nun. CBS had a new episode of California Fever called The Girl from Somewhere with actress Elizabeth McGovern, guest starring as an army brat who doesn't want to move away with her father, a general. And NBC was showing the National League baseball playoffs. The Pittsburgh Pirates beat the Cincinnati Reds 3-2. to two. Let's take time out from this triple play to talk about Farmy Dan's pure pork sausage. Mm -hmm. So those choices, Peter? What are you watching? Probably happy days. In my household, certainly because of my father, we would have been watching the National League Baseball playoffs that night. Marion Goes to Jail was directed by Jerry Paris, and it was written by a lady named Barbara Berkowitz. This was her only happy day script. Barbara's other TV writing credits include What's Happening, What's Happening Now, The Facts of Life, and Munsters Today. She's also been a creative consultant on numerous films written and directed by Henry Jaglum, including Eating, Venice Venice, Festival in Cannes, and Hollywood Dreams. I can't seem to relax ever when I go to any audition, ever. And all I want to do is act and be an actress. As for guest stars this week, nobody knew, but we have a couple of returnees. Ed Peck returns as Officer Kirk. This was the sixth of his nine appearances on the show. Anything new to say about Ed Peck as Officer Kirk? He's pretty much the same as before, and he doesn't get a ton to do in this episode, although seeing as the role of police officer who tells them what happened to the car could have been anyone, it's nice that it was a recurring character. My favorite thing that they wrote for Officer Kirk to do is when they're leaving the Cunningham house, he orders Richie to go back in and lock the door. Young Cunningham, get back! in there. Lock that door. You want to lose your house? No, no, no. Peck may be a power-hungry jackass, but you should lock the door when you leave the house. We also have Marsha Lewis as Gloria, the prison matron. Oh, Marion, your children have lovely hair. <laughs> hey, you go without saying, big boy. Marsha had previously played Mother Dunbar in the episode Hard Cover. Marsha was a regular on at least two other shows with close ties to Happy Days, Who's Watching the Kids and Good Time Girls. Then the Good Time Girls are in for a wild old time. I told you this was going to happen. When three eager fiancés show up all at once for the same girl. She died in 2010 at the age of 72. Did you have any feelings about Marsha Lewis as Gloria? We know from Al and Anthony Del Vecchio that identical twins played by the same actor are a thing on Happy Days. So my headcanon is that Mother Dunbar and Gloria are twins. I thought Gloria was a very fun character. I like that she and Marion had this instant rapport. And I like that she's only working at the jail in order to pay for beauty school. I thought that was a fun little bit. I thought so, too. I was glad that Marion had a friend inside the jail. But it seems like Marion is the kind of person who would make friends wherever she went, including jail. Exactly. Remember the kissing bandit where she was about to invite everyone there to come over to, to their house for, I, I think it was dinner? I think even if worse came to worse and she had to spend the five days in jail, I think she would have gotten through it. As for songs this week, we have Who Put the Bump by Barry Mann. 
Who put the bomb in the bomb, 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 bomb? Who put the rhyme in the rhyme, rhyme, a ding, dong? And at the courthouse, we hear the Dragnet theme by Walter Schumann. As for cultural and historical references, Happy Days has made many jokes about Howard's DeSoto in the past, but I think this is the first time it's ever been identified as a 1949 DeSoto. The car Howard usually drives is a 1948 DeSoto Suburban, a chunky tank-like vehicle with room for eight passengers and an optional luggage rack on the roof. One of the pennants at Arnold says, Marshall. I'm assuming this was an inside joke, but there is a Marshall University in Huntington, West Virginia. Today, we're coming Coming to you from Scenic Marshall University, named after U.S. Chief Justice John Marshall and established as the Marshall Academy before becoming a university in 1961. One of the cool things about this episode is that because of the accident, there's a lot of scenes inside Arnold's and we get some angles of Arnold's that we don't normally get. Because of the big honking hole in the wall. Howard says that a little snow never hurt Arnie Palmer. Born in Pennsylvania in 1929, Arnold Palmer became one of the most famous and successful professional golfers in American history. His fame coincided with the rise of television in the 1950s, so he became familiar to the entire nation and earned the nickname The King. I couldn't find any particularly famous examples of Arnold Palmer golfing in the snow, but at the 1962 Bing Crosby golf tournament he did give an informal clinic during a snow delay huh. well jim uh this is the first time that i can remember of being in a tournament that was called off because of snow uh-huh i feel like becoming a golf superstar could have only happened back in the days when there was like nothing else to watch on tv but then again tiger woods i guess some people just want something very very boring to watch in golf obviously the object is to get the lowest possible score anything below 120 is considered respectable for an 18 hole course hence joni's joke about Howard breaking 150. I think this is the year you're going to break 100. And 50. The graffiti outside Al's reads Don Juan in huge letters. Also known as Don Giovanni, Don Juan is a famous fictional seducer. His story has been told in many ways in many formats since at least the 1600s, including an opera by Mozart. Don Juan was probably referring to Fonzie. I would assume so. Ralph says, Dr. Livingston, I presume. Dr. David Livingston was a Scottish physician and missionary born in 1813. He was presumed to be lost in Africa until he was discovered by a Welsh-American journalist named Henry Morton Stanley in 1871. What do you mean saying Dr. Livingston, I presume? I say Mr. Stanley, I presume. Oh, no, you don't. I said it first. Unfortunately, by then, Livingston was very ill, and he died a couple of years later. Stanley's famous quote may have been a fabrication. Look for the civil defense sign. That's a circle with three black triangles against a yellow background next to the courthouse door. It indicates that the building serves as a fallout shelter in case of attack. Oh, wow. This was like the worst to me, and civil defense was heavy then. I don't know if you remember this, but this was like an overriding concern. They spent so much time talking about it. That I had nightmares. I cared. First of all, they were very subtle. They told us, children, the siren means disaster. (laughs) Chachi calls Howard Frosty the Golf Man. This refers to the classic Christmas song, Frosty the Snowman, written in 1950 by Walter Rollins and Steve Nelson as a direct response to the success of Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. Like Rudolph, Frosty was first recorded by Gene Autry. And although frequently served in Chinese restaurants, fortune cookies are not Chinese in origin. They probably developed from cookies made by Japanese immigrants to America. No one seems to know who had the idea of putting slips of paper with fortunes printed on them inside the cookies, but this practice seems to go back to the 1910s. Other observations this week. This episode begins the era of Howard wearing glasses, but Tom Bosley hasn't yet started wearing those tinted lenses that he's going to wear. The ones that make him look like Hunter S. Thompson. What is gonzo journalism, and why do you call it that? That word has really plagued me, because uh, first I realized I was doing something different. It's at some point, really, for Scanlon's magazine rather than Rolling Stone, even before Rolling Stone. To me, in the later seasons, Howard looks a little too showbiz. He starts unbuttoning too many buttons at the top of his shirt (laughs) and flaring his collar out. To me, that's the classic show showbiz phony look. I think Happy Days is subtly preparing us for the eventual destruction of Arnold's. First, Richie's usual table was destroyed in Chachi's and Credo Wax. Now the wall on the left side of the set is knocked down by the DeSoto. <laughs> 
also, Arnold's is at the bottom of a hill? Since when? Oh, I mean, I guess they've never said that it wasn't at the bottom of a hill. Notice that Joni gets French toast and Richie gets blueberry pancakes. Joni's French toast and your blueberry pancakes are in the oven. As established in multiple episodes, Joni's obsessed with France. And we all know that Richie's theme song is Blueberry Hill. So I like that their breakfasts were thematically appropriate. <laughs> we get a Paula Petrolunga reference in this episode, so the show remembers its own past. Hooray! But on the other hand, Joni sets up Marion for a perfect sit-on-it moment when she says, well, what do we tell Dad? But Marion doesn't say, tell your father to sit on it. Instead, she makes a DeSoto joke. Are we past the sit-on-it era of Happy Days? Yeah, I guess so. I guess that catchphrase has worn out its welcome. We're at the end of an era, man. R.I.P. to sit on it, I guess. Born in season three, died in season seven. Peter, were there any outstanding Happy Days fashions this week? I really like the ensemble that Marion was wearing at the beginning of the episode. It's this black and yellow, black and yellow, black and yellow, black and yellow, black and yellow combination dress and shawl with a matching hat. It's very mid-century and it's very chic. Have we ever seen her in that before? I don't think we have. So I guess Marion dresses up when she goes shopping. Yeah, it makes sense. So, Peter, I will ask that age-old timeless question. Was this episode any good? Eh. And- There is a lot of stuff in this episode that I do like, but I'm not wild about the fact that this episode is about setting Marion up for a fall, for something that we ultimately learn isn't even her fault. This is an episode that reinforces Howard's love for Marion, and that he does care about her more than his Soto, and that even if he loses his temper sometimes, he does genuinely care about her. But also, in order to get there, we had to basically humiliate Marion first, and I'm not wild about that. I also kind of wish that the revelation that actually the whole thing was Howard's fault hadn't just been in the tag because sometimes tags get cut for syndication and without the tag the episode is completely different yeah the tag really changes the story the episode that this reminded me of was marion rebels one of the things that was bad about marion rebels unfortunately is that in order to build marion back up at the end they have to spend a lot of time tearing her down and the same thing happens this week at least this week it's only howard being awful to her and not her entire family in marion rebels everybody's horrible to her but it's still the same where this plot requires Howard to be worse than he normally would be so that Marion is broken down. And because we love Marion so much, it's tough to see her like that. I don't really want to see her have to go to jail to prove a point. And then there's a pretty heart-wrenching scene where she's talking to Fonzie and she breaks down. Yes. I just hated him. I've done the really stupid thing. I want to go home. And then she has to pretend to be happy when Howard comes in. The thing I guess that I like about this episode is that it's a great showcase for Marion Ross. We get more Marion than we normally get in an episode. So oh, yeah. I, I can't quibble with that. But unfortunately, these kinds of stories are like, well, let's drag Marion down to hell for two thirds of the episode. That was my problem with Marion Rebels. And it's also my problem with Marion Goes to Jail. They can't think of anything for her to do other than suffer, I suppose. Marion should have gotten to kill someone. It didn't even have to be on purpose. It could have been manslaughter. In the 1970s, I suppose, the worst they could think of is that her car rolls down a hill and rolls through Arnold's. And conveniently doesn't run anyone over. Yeah, nothing like that happens. So it's a good showcase for Marion Ross, but it's tough to watch Marion drag through the mud like this for most of the show. Also, I have to point out Howard's golfing outfit that he wears for most of this. Oh God, yes, with the bucket hat. That's a very unique look. I didn't know what to think about it. I guess we're extending the theme of Howard being bad at every game and every sport. We've had him be bad at cards. We've had him be bad at bowling. And now this is him being bad at golf. They have him wear the, a sky blue tracksuit with the sky blue bucket hat to the jail at the end. And to me, that undercut the emotion just a little bit because Howard is sort of dressed like a 1980s rapper. <laughs> My radio, believe me, I like it loud. I'm the man with the box that can rock the crowd. That kind of undermined the emotional effect of it. So, Peter, how can people keep up with us and find out about all the wonderful things that we are doing? Listeners can follow us on Twitter at Fonzie Podcast. They can follow me on Twitter at Peter Volfrank. That's P-E-T-E-R-V-U-L-F-R-A-N-C. And they can follow me on Twitter at Joe underscore A underscore Blevins. They can find this podcast online at thesedaysareours.libsyn.com. And they can email us with questions, comments, and concerns at thesedaysareourspodcast at gmail.com. So, Peter, what do we have on the docket for next week? Next week, Richie gets employed and has to deal with a mean co-worker in Richie's job. Sounds like another nail-biter. So, see you later, alligator. In a while, crocodile. Oh, little girls, now 
Now you're trapped in this cruel, crazy world You feel so ashamed You insist you were framed And you cling to your soul At least till parole So misunderstood Now you're missing the life That was so good Yes, it was See you in court.